Starling tests set to commence in the far northern hemisphere. This is a Talking Science Story of the Week. I'm Matt Miller. You're on Trek Zone. With the latest science and space news five days a week across Apple Podcasts, Spotify, Google Podcasts and YouTube, this is Talking Science with Dr. Brad Tucker and Matt Miller. Alrighty, Brad, our next story, Starlink. Uh, we've been talking about, uh, for so long it seems, how those little satellites are causing so many big problems uh, for astronomers. Uh, and to SpaceX's credit, they are working on ways of uh, fixing that problem and, uh, and dimming them down. Uh, but the news this week is that uh, they're looking to start tests. They've announced for uh, for one of the probably more long awaited re- infra- you know releases of of just what it's going to do that they're looking for both beta testers, but they've kind of given some details about what their plan view in terms of rollout is, what the receivers will look like, and also more importantly, the speeds people can expect. From Starlink. And there are currently 540 satellites in orbit. Uh, eventually they want 12,000 of them. Uh, and when you see these launches on the Falcon 9 rockets and they just release the payload fairing and all of these satellites just disperse, it, it's an incredible sight. Uh, but it's in, also incredible to think that we're not even a quarter of the way there on on what on how many that they want to have in orbit. Yeah, we're, we're not even we're 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 about a twenty fifth of what they want. <laughs> you know that that is a long way to go in terms of having a full functional network. But as they say, one of the things they're trying to do is a just get the first network up, and it's also about latitude. So this announcement of looking at beta testers is for people in the far northern latitudes where just by simple geometry you'd need less satellites because of the surface area uh, and therefore you you can do this with the satellites that they have up at least they think so and so they they said people you know kind of Seattle and Canada and then kind of London and, and northern Europe uh, could sign up to be beta testing uh, to so they can start getting users on how the loads would work lags measuring speeds practical things you know all those sorts of things you need to do um, and they said they're hopeful for a more global rollout, uh, potentially in 2021. So maybe only you know 12 to 18 months away. Well, SpaceX board director Steve uh, Jervison uh, recently posted on Twitter um, a screenshot of an iPhone detecting five Starlink Wi-Fi networks. So uh, this is happening and it's working. I guess this is the biggest the biggest thing is that. Being able to see this now and with the beta testing, uh, we'll be able to, as you say, pro- proof of concept, really. Uh, there's there's a lot that's gone into uh, Starlink to get it to this point before there's even really confirmation that it works on, on what they want it to do. Exactly. That's right. You know, it, they, they, they have a goal, they have a vision, but they need people to start playing around with it and trying it. It's one good thing for people in their company who are not dependent on this to use it. But if you really want people to use it as their data internet provider, you know, you need reliability, you need the speeds. And as you said, you you need to be able to always have that ability that uh, there's always going to be a satellite in there. And, you know, it's simple things like the handshakes, right? Uh, you know, a key aspect here is if the satellites are rotating, that your network just bounces from one satellite to the next. Kind of like if you're driving on a, you know, in a car and you're on hands-free and your mobile phone connects to the next tower tower on the ground in this case satellite in space you know that has to work flawlessly you don't want to have it keeping dropping out and needing to reconnect every 10 minutes no one would go for that so it's all these little simple things that the devil's in the detail and it needs to be be working and they need to test it and loads right if it's one thing to have some people in your company who know what they're doing and literally having PhDs and masters and built the thing know how to use it it's one thing for average person who just wants to get online to be able to use it. And I did like how you say that uh, if it continually drops out and uh, only lasts 10 minutes before you have to reconnect, uh, people won't go for it. 
unless a federal government forces that sort of technology down people's throats and cuts off their old internet connections, like the uh, National Broadband Network here in Australia, I, I had to get a, simula a, a similarity in there at some point. Well, look, yeah, I mean, th there are different ways, but you're also looking at, well, Australia is backwards in its internet, let's be serious. <laughs> Ports of uh, America, right, in Northern Europe or in Europe, these that already have this access do have high-speed fiber cable or fiber to the house. And so the, the increase in speeds, because they are talking about, you know, looking at a gigabyte per second with Starlink, that is an increase in speed, but they already have pretty good speeds and very good reliability. Now in Australia, as you said, yes, we're desperate. We'll take whatever we can get. And look, <laughs> there's already people who use NBN satellite, the Telstar in Australia, and this could be a lot more you know, useful and reliable, hopefully. Uh, but again, it just has to work large scale in order to see that return, in order for them also to dedicate to build, you know, another 11,500 satellites. I am thinking, though, that if uh, SpaceX is listening to this podcast, as I'm sure they listen to our show every week, uh, and they need a, a country as a whole to test their new technology, I'm pretty sure Australians will put up their hand and... Uh, and uh, yeah, look, as I said, yeah. Uh, I mean, the fact that we can get speeds, you know, at least 10 times better than what we currently... It's just even allowed on this continent. Ten times bigger than our, our theoretical maximum. So it's not yeah, exactly that's right. In practicality, a hundred times, <laughs> hundred, uh, you know, to to one hundred and fifty times faster. Yeah, it's it's not a, a hard <laughs> question for people to jump on. Well, Brad, watch this space. I think will be the will be the thing as these beta testing results come out for Starlink. Uh, it's uh, going to be really interesting and. I mean, as we've talked about, and, we, and, and you know, like I said at the start of this story of the week, we, we've been focusing on uh, the issues with astronomy, uh, with Starlink, because of Starlink. But we always have countered that by saying that there is a great benefit that can be brought by Starlink uh, and formerly OneWeb before they went bankrupt. So uh, I guess Starlink's got a leg up on that. Uh, but there, there, are, there are benefits, whether they outweigh the negatives, uh, I, I guess only time will tell. That's right. Exactly. You know, you can imagine this. If, if it isn't working, then, you know, will they proceed with the network? What would that mean for the industry as a whole? Because that's that's the other key aspect here. It's not just SpaceX. It's all the other companies who are looking at doing this because people are trying to buy out one web and continue that project. Amazon has a vision. So there's lots of other groups thinking about this vision. It's all about getting it right and working uh, and showing that, as you said, it's not just a theoretical idea that works on paper, but does work to the end user. Because that's the goal here is the average person has reliable, fast speed internet. And if it's not that, it won't work. Brad, awesome. Thanks for diving into this Talking Science Story of the Week. Take care.